On this edition of Fly Fish, we head to Michigan's mighty Manistee River for instruction on a couple of different ways to fish steelhead. First, we look at how to get the proper swing of a fly with both conventional and spay gear. Then, Kelly will go over how to use a right angle indicator system to fish for steelhead. It's more talk than fishing, but on this early spring outing, we still hope to find some of the brighter fish moving up river. Our guide is Ray Schmidt, who owns and operates a fly shop and lodge with his wife Angie in nearby Wellston. Ray has been wound up in fly fishing most of his life, going all the way back to his uncle's knee where he first started to learn how to tie flies. A passion for fishing, flies, and Angie led to a small tying and distribution business that led to a career as a manufacturer's representative for scientific angler that has led full circle to more fishing and flies on their home waters of northwestern Lower Michigan. One of the regional guides and fly shop owners Ray Schmidt kept his eye on over his years in the business happens to be the host of this episode of Fly Fish, Kelly Gallup. Kelly guided, ran a fly shop, and was on his way to becoming a recognized fly fisher and tire when he wisely decided to consult with Ray on a regular basis. This angling duo have spent a lot of time chewing over flies and the ways to fish them, and we'll share some of the fruits of these discussions in this show. Kelly will also stay with us to tie one of his favorite patterns that he says works as well for trout and rivers and lakes as it does for steelhead on the Manistee. He calls it Gallup Swimming Hex Nip, and like a lot of Kelly's flies, the pattern has a lot of elements that make it a fishy creation you'll want to add to your arsenal. In our instructional segment for this episode, it is more from the Fly Fish TV how-to video Wet Fly Ways with expert Davey Watt. Davey will be taking us through the details of the proper presentation of a cast of wet flies upstream. Traditionally, much of American wet fly fishing has been done down and across stream, but as you will see, there is a lot to be said for fishing wet flies and soft tackles directly upstream. All this just ahead. I think the most traditional way of steelheading, at least historically, would probably be the swing method where you're using a sinking line. Uh, I think it, you know, traditionally I think it started with the heads like you're going to show here. And then when Jimmy Teeny came out with the connected head with the T-series, that was probably the next transition. But I think historically probably this is the most common way to fish steelhead. before the new generation, so to speak, came along. What would you say? I agree. Uh, you know, this shooting head uh, swing method has been around forever. Guys using uh, lead core, chunks mm -hmm. of lead core, uh, up to about 30 feet long, backing mm -hmm. it up with monofilament and using that as a, yep. as a head yep. to get the fly down and to swing. I agree. Uh, and uh, as you say, the progression of things in the last 20 or 25 right. years with the, with the Jim Teeny lines marrying both the, the shooting right. line and the head together, correct? Which simply was, it, it's basically the same thing, but you didn't have to take it apart. Let's just walk through it, just sure. kind of where it starts and how it's, because we've, we've got two different systems here. We've got a single hand and a, and a spay rod or a two-hander. Uh, just go kind of through what, what it takes here. What do we... What do we have here? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you know, a traditional steelhead rod is a seven to nine weight. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens to be a seven because today we're going to fish these May steelhead. They're smaller in size. They're five to seven pounds. So a seven right. weight's perfect. Nine <laughs> to nine and a half foot long. This happens to be a nine and a half footer. Yeah. Uh, you know, a nice uh, disc drag reel, high quality reel, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, we're, we've got a variety of flies that we're going to use on this uh, down and across swing sink tip method. Mm -hmm. uh, short leaders, the leaders are uh, about four feet, no longer than four feet, yep. as you're illustrating and very there. very simple. Very simple, just yep. a two-step leader system. Uh, I use a two-step, lots of folks just yep. simply use a single a uh, strand of monofilament that might be uh, four feet long of, say, 10-pound mm -hmm. test. Yeah, I, I do the two also, just so what we've got here is just a, a stationary butt. 
Yep. And then you can just add your tippet to it. Uh, and, and it's just it's just uh, whatever amount of filament you choose to use. Right. But like you said, it's just a straight shot with uh, not much more than right. just two to three feet and plus your butt section, which could make it four. Right. This, you know, and, and this line is pretty easy to identify uh, because the sinking tip or the head portion of it, they, all the manufacturers now make those dark brown or gray, and then as soon as it changes color here mm -hmm. on this particular sink rate, these are generally color coded by right. their sink rate, you know, yep. whether it's a 130 or a 150 or a 200 or 300. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's where Jim Teeny came in with the, uh, the T200, 300, 400. And if you hear people, even though they aren't Jim's lines anymore a lot of times, everyone still says T200, T300. The T means nothing other than that was, it's kind of a courtesy to Jim Teeny that it's a 200 grain head. You know, the 200, 300 grain lines, they're connected and they're, they're a solid. Uh, connection. It's one line, but you've got uh, pockets here of, of uh, different heads, and that's traditionally this is actually a head. And even though we call these lines a 200 grain head, this is what they're originally talking about. Correct. The different lengths, and there's different terminologies. Uh, explain to me uh, how how we go through these heads here, because you can use them on either a single hand or a, a spay line. It doesn't matter. And a lot of people I know are starting to use these again. Correct. Well, again, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, folks are using these because of the technology of looping the two together have mm -hmm. greatly improved so they don't hinge. And that was the advantage uh, of the Teeny Series lines was you didn't right. have a clumsy hinge joining right. the two. Well, now the hinging technology, the uh, joining technology to eliminate that hinge is gone. So, whether you use a single hand rod like this or a two handed rod like this, this tip system allows you to go to the river with a leader wallet like this, or mm -hmm. a head wallet, right. and you've got, uh, you know, 150 grain heads as you can see here, a 200 grain, a 300 grain that we mm -hmm. loop onto the end of this running line. Right. So you've got that, and now two um, manufacturers are labeling their lines in types, a right. type three. Yeah, I see you've got a type eight here. Right. So it kind of uh, goes again by sink rate. The lower mm -hmm. the sink rate will be labeled a three, a six will be a faster mm -hmm. sinking, and an eight even faster. Right. And those are generally uh, shorter than what we would traditionally call a head. A head is usually 25 to 30 feet. These sink tips, which mm -hmm. they rate by the three, six, and eight, are generally 12 to 15 feet. You can see here I've got this one labeled. Uh, this is a type eight. Mm -hmm. 15 foot. So there's a, a slight difference and it just simply means uh, a difference in length whether it's called a tip or a head. Right. So show me the, the way that you connect these and the new heads and kind of the new technology you've got here. Sure. Uh, well here it is. It's simple. Uh, the new technology is actually welding these loops so it's part of the fly line so there's mm -hmm. no uh, connectors or sleeves or right. little shrink film things that we once used to use. Which used to come undone occasionally also. They absolutely could. Uh, the uh, fly lines themselves, they use a stiffening agent on the loop so we don't get any hinging at this mm -hmm. loop connector. Uh, when we connect these loops we want to make sure that the loop comes down and forms a square knot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also identify uh, the heads with a number uh, with a uh, permanent pin, a fine mm -hmm. permanent pin, uh, to t just put the type on, whether mm -hmm. it's a, right. a type 3 or a type 6 or a 150 yeah, or a 200 Yeah, I see you've got it on your floating line here. And I do. I, I mark my floating lines the same way. A wide bar represents five. Mm -hmm. uh, small hash marks, as you see here, represent right. one. So this is a wide bar and two marks. That means it's a seven, seven way. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. I get it. Just to simplify the system. And you can do that on your own. You can come up with your own system, however you want to work Absolutely. It. But this is right. pretty universal, right. and, uh, uh, right. but that's the, that's the deal. Well, I see we, this is a small example, you know, just a small box of swing flies. And, and, and I think there's some pretty similar characteristics to most of these flies. They aren't really complicated. I've got one here that has kind of been a standard for me for you know, 10, 15 years when I've done this, and it's just a real basic uh, fluffy fly that has a lot of movement, and I think that's common to 
Uh, these are all your patterns. You're looking for a fly with a lot of soft material, not a lot, but soft material uh, that undulates in the water mm -hmm. and is not really specific to really one thing or another. It's like, well, it's kind of a sculpin, kind of a minnow, kind of this or that. Lots of movement and light and easy, and easy to cast too. They're really easy to cast. You can see, uh, Kelly, I, there's some different flies here. There's some darker flies and lighter flies and, and uh, a white and a black, for example. You right. can't get any different than black and white. But we do that for light conditions and water conditions. For example, today is a dark day. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're probably going to use a little darker fly, heavy right. cloud cover. It should be a pretty good day for fishing. Let's get out and you know just try. What do, what do we have here? We've got a kind of a long shelf of a gravel uh, mix of grass and gravel. Well, there's really there's there's not much grass here. This is a nice riffle run down through here, as you can mm -hmm. see. We've got a thin shelf uh, and then a trough out about halfway across, and we're going to step and swing down through here. We've got mm -hmm. steelhead staged all through this run. Okay. Uh, we were able to float over it earlier, and we saw them right. in deep, we saw them right. in shallow, so uh, this is just a great General spot. General two foot, three foot maybe? Yeah, uh, two, to yeah. yeah two, two to three feet. Yeah, two to three feet. So. What we're going to start with here is we're going to quarter this off, we're, we're going to section this off. In a traditional swing fishing, you don't plant your feet and stay in one spot long. It's kind of like any other aggressive fish, you're looking for a fish that you know, you're going you're to present the fly to the fish, you're going to give them a few chances to take it, but we're not going to sit here and just pound the death out of a, a single stretch. We're going to present the fly with a swing technique, which means we're going to throw our lines out and we're going to try to swing the fly in front of the fish. That does not mean we're going to belly the line. We don't want the line to hit like this and the fly to be trailing the head. We want the fly to hit Ray's going to show you when he sets up his thing, he, with his cast, he's going to cast across and he's going to mend the line and he'll, he'll explain that. But the idea here is that the fly is in front of the fly line. It's not swinging like a big arc like this, even though it sounds like that's what we're doing. Because a lot of traditional streamer fishing is done with a, what was called a swing method and they actually did that. They would drag the belt. line the belly would drag and the fly would end up there eventually. We're going to try to have the fly be presented to the fish before the line is. So it's going to swing but it's going to be in front of the line. And when we walk out Ray's going to show you with his system with the two-handed system and then I'm going to follow up with the way I do it with the, uh, the single hand rod but it's going to be exactly the same thing as far as the fly is concerned. Make a few casts take a step. A few casts, make a step. And we'll just, we'll cover that in, sequ in sequential casts all the way down to that big tree down there. Let's go. After you. <clears throat> you've, again, you've got a 15 foot head, right? I've got a 15, that's a 15 foot type 6 and all I'm doing here is I'm starting this run very close to me. So I really don't have enough line to do a traditional anchor spay cast at the beginning of the run. All I'm doing is I'm just going to start right here in front making sure that I cover this in close first. And I'm just going to sequentially start working my way out. And again, the fly is swinging in front of the head or the tip. It is. It's I'll not bellying like this. It's, it's quartering down like that. Correct. I'm placing, if I'm looking at the river, let's just use a clock for an example, Kelly. Straight out is 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I like to place my cast between 1 and 1.30. As soon as the sinking head hits the water, I lift then in a mend. It's a lift mend, not a roll cast, but a, mm -hmm. a, a lift mend, or, and just to pick the, sh the back side of the head up, mm -hmm. and that allows the tip to swing straight. The flies downstream, and then then we start this drop and swing and follow, mm -hmm. and the fly then is is right. way out in front of the fly line. So 
In a two-handed cast, of course, you come up, set your anchor, come around, form your D-loop, and go. Then here, you lift and mend. Now the shooting head is straight. I'm holding it back a little bit. There's and, a oh, trout. there was a, there was a trout. Um, so we're gonna go down, lift, traditional spay cast, set your anchor, come around, stab a D-loop, go, lift the head back out, and now we're gonna swing here. There's a lot of trout working this run, uh, so we're gonna have trout teasing us here while we're trying to get at those steelhead. So I'm just gonna sequentially now continue to work line out. Lift, set your anchor, make that cast down and across, mend to the head or lift mend to the head and hold it back and now follow. And what that sinking head is doing is getting the fly down and now we're swinging, which is this down and across swing. That's how it's got its name across and down. With the traditional swing with a with the T-series line or a shooting head line if you will the 25, 24, 25 foot heads there's a couple things that are that you need to know when you start using these lines uh, probably the most important thing is as far as the cast goes is that you have to realize that there's a color change here you can see in the fly line that Ray was talking about earlier and the color change with these lines has to be somewhere in the rod to cast them efficiently. And what I mean by that is you can't have a bunch of that yellow line sticking out past the tip. There's just not enough weight in the line to cast it, so you always make sure that the color change is somewhere in the tip. It doesn't matter how far, but at some point it has to be in there. These are called shooting heads for a reason. They're designed to bring in, you don't false cast the shooting heads a lot. You bring them in, you do a single roll cast to get the line in front of you, and then you just shoot the line like that. Not a lot of false casting with these lines. Now, when I cast this line, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring it up, get it into the color change, do a single roll, and now when I cast to do my pre presentation, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to throw this out and I'm going to do a reach cast upstream because the floating portion of the line isn't heavy enough to manipulate the head. I like to set the head as it hits the water. I like it to set at about a 40 degree angle when, I first, when it first hits the water. So if you watch what I do, I set the line out, do my roll cast, and as I cast, I reach and I've already got this 40, 45 degree angle set, so I can lift up a little bit, let the fly get below the head, and then I just start my swing. As you, as you progress and you're adding line and you wanna shoot a little bit further, there's, there are two things you do. One, you strip it off and so you've got it in your hand and coil it. Try not, try not to let it get in this hydraulic down here. You have to have some control over it, so you might have to hold one or two loops. But the other thing you do is as you set your line, you shoot a little higher. Your projection is up a little bit more, so you're kind of throwing the loop a little higher just to give yourself a little bit more projection out there. But you'll find that with these shooting heads that the running line is so light, it's pretty efficient. You'll, you'll pick this cast up very quickly if you haven't done it. One roll to get it up and just shoot a little higher. Got out! Oh! Bummer! Yo, did he drill me? That was a huge fish. God, he just clobbered me. Got me. Did he rip the fly off? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ray, the, the system that I'm going to rig up here is called a right angle system. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I really like this for the shallower you know under four foot of water and it's pretty simple all I'm going to do is take a piece of pre-treated poly yarn you can get it in any color shop sell it you can buy it at craft stores whatever and I'm just going to take a you know piece of this and I'm going to wrap the, the mono around it or around the yarn 
I'm gonna do a clinch nut. Standard five or six turn. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's really not, this knot is just to, the other knot that I'm going to tie on here is going to butt up against it. So as long as it holds that yarn, I'm, uh, I'm happy. Good. So cut that end off and I just simply come in and cut the yarn so it's the same length, which isn't really all that critical. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of, uh, I don't, this isn't really the butt section anymore, and it's not really the tip, but it's just kind of the transitional part that's going to sink. Okay, sure. And I can use, and that's what makes the right angle system so effective here, is that I can use pretty light leader. It's not mm -hmm. tapered, so I'm not having to pull the tapered leader underwater. Sure. So I'm going to use straight eight pound maxima, and I like to run this piece about twice the depth of the water. Okay. And, you know, it's about three feet out there where I'm going to go and fish, and so I'm going to take this and Go above this and just do another clinch knot. So I've got the clinch knot that I tied the mono to the uh, indicator with, and then I'm going to butt these two together. Yep, that looks that looks familiar. All right, so now I got that trimmed off. So that's the right angle right there. Oh yeah. And so sure. it's going straight down off the indicator. And you see, and I've got two and a half, three foot here between them. Now, the the tippet material we're using here, the pound test is six pound, six pound maxima. A that's that's yeah. mostly what we use here in these clear water yep. Michigan streams. And I'm just going to do a blood knot. And what the blood knot's for? One is to join that to the uh, eight pound, but it's also to stop the split shot from sliding down my line. Sure. My split shot is going to be set, you know, I've got to adjust it as I go. Sure. I, you know, I might need two, I might need one, but it's real easy to, you know, add and subtract. And from this, I'm just going to do a two fly rig like we always do. I'll put sure. a, an egg or a small nymph up and then I'm going to put another one below it. Sure. We used to call it green eggs and ham because it's, everybody ran the same thing. Now we like, uh, Kelly, this eye-to-eye -eye system uh, when we're using this uh, strike indicator method uh, for steelhead and, and trout as well because rather than the dropper tag we, we once used, mm -hmm. when you're casting that dropper tag would have a tendency to tangle right. as you would yeah. the cast would turn sure. over. So this eye-to-eye -eye that you explained is, is right on and I think uh, that, that's a good tip. Yeah, it'll help out. I'm going to put a little swimming hex below it and if that doesn't work, I'll probably switch over to a caddis. We're already starting to, finally, the sun's breaking out, get a little heat. But, uh, you know, I always, I almost always have a combo of egg and something else. Unless I really know they're on a, a big bite for, you know, a, a hex nymph or whatever, and then I might switch to doubles. But for the most part, it's going to be an egg and a nymph. The combination of the little egg fly mm -hmm. and a nymph, stone fly, yep. caddis larva, hex nymph, here is the hot ticket. Yeah. So just to recap here, this is about two and a half feet. Mm -hmm. Our indicator, our yarn indicator, the eight pound maxima dropping off this heavy butt section material and that's yep. going to slide Slides down. Right in. And right it'll stay there once you it's start stay, fishing. Yeah, stay it right that's there. great. Dropping down, this is eight pound test. Mm -hmm. Down to your blood knot, this is about twice the depth of the water column. Yep. We're, we're saying it's about you know three feet of water, so this is six feet long. Your yeah. blood knot to blood your knot. actual tippet material, and then the split shot is attached just mm -hmm. above that blood knot, so it doesn't slide anywhere. Correct. Perfect. Well, you know, let's let's take it fishing. Let's find out. I'm all. There's a couple out there with been calling this way. Roly poly. Oh boy, look at them right here, close, Kelly. There's about four four of them right there. Can you see them? I can, even though I'm lower. A lot lower. <laughs> when I finish the cast off, it's down here. What I like to do, I just do a simple roll cast up and one nice big open loop. Not a tight loop, a nice big open loop. Kind of a, you know, just a lob. And then allow it to hit, and if you can, do your roll, nice big open loop, and do a little reach so your line is already above the indicator. If it goes under, I lift my line up just to break it off bottom. 
the idea is to let the lead go along the bottom smoothly, but if it hangs up, you, you have to respond to it with a little bit of a touch, not ripping the fly out of the water. You want to try to get a feel for what you think's a strike and what you think's bottom. After one or two drifts, you should see, okay, it's tapping, it's tapping, it's tapping. I just broke it off bottom, letting it drift, good. If I do that four or five times and I don't see the indicator do anything, it's telling me I need more lead. It's bouncing perfectly right there. Perfect, 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 no respond. So if I can, I'm gonna take this line, I'm gonna do a reach cast up, and I'm gonna let it get right to here. I'm gonna do a single mend if I feel I need to, but I'm not gonna do any more. I'm gonna try to keep the fly line above the indicator the whole time and just work it down without any drag on the line and just the uh, just the tension from the the fly line above it Clever little fish. Alrighty. When I set this and I get in the deeper water here, I don't care if that indicator goes under. I'm watching it as long as it, you know, if it goes under and I can see it, that's fine. I don't care if I'm not trying to use this as a float. I'm trying to use it as an indicator of what's happening on the bottom. So I'm just dropping along, it's fine right now. I'm feeding a little extra line, trying to get to the back side of that, and I just had a little trout eat it. Just trying to get to the back side of that. Nice high drift there, ooh. Getting a little shallower. Mr. Big there, buddy. Oh. That a boy, Kelly. See if he'll come back up here before he goes into that log jam. He hasn't. Boy, that's a studly little guy. That didn't go three feet. That indicator just barely moved. Wow, he's just being way too cooperative. I don't quite understand this. The fish's head, when he starts rolling like that, you want to keep the line pressure below him as much as you can so he doesn't spin on it. Oh. I got some logs down there I want to stay away from. Now he knows he's awake. Doesn't like the wind, evidently. I think those. Oh. That door like on the that. log jam, Kelly. Mine down a little right. further, Kelly. Yeah. Just want to take a little bath right there. I want to get along. We got trouble right there. Pick her nose up. Yep, right over it. You know, I hate to say this. It's the first pass with your hex nip. Okay. 
Pick your nose up again. Yep. Oh, we're good. We're good. Coming up. Woo, yeah, baby. Come on. Ready? She's just about. There we go. Oh, nope, not, not yet. There. Not yet. Oh, it's a gorgeous fish. There we go. Here we go. I can't see the logs. Come on, baby. Nose up. All right. Here we go. Just a second. Just a second. Oh. There you go. Beauty. <laughs> oh, is that a gorgeous, bright spring hen? Oh, man. That was the first fly cast out of her mouth. The first cast with your hex nip. Oh boy. Here, baby. Ouch. Need the hemos. Ouch. I can live without that. Uh... There it is. Okay, we're clear. Wild fish. Really wild. How much chromer does it get than that? Beautiful wild Great Lakes steelhead. That's about as wild as they get. Beautiful. She hasn't been here long. Uh-uh. Couple days. Couple days. You never get tired of these uh, things. That's beautiful. You got a little bit of... Let her go. Get up there, girl. First cast of that hex. Wow. Up. Okay. She's got eggs up high. Away she goes. She's happy. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. Thank you. Beautiful job. Gorgeous fish. Good net job. Well, that was worth it. <laughs> that pretty fish. Wild all the way. She got some good jumps. She yeah, oh, that was a beautiful jump, about four and a half, five yeah. foot eye level. Four foot for you. <laughs> Six foot for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking up. <laughs> Gallup Swimming Hex Nymph is one of Kelly's favorites for steelhead and trout. It just comes alive in the water, and seldom will he head out without it. It's not complicated to tie, but as usual, he adds a few twists and turns that you'll want to keep track of. The fly we're going to tie this morning is a swimming hex nymph. This is one of my favorite flies for steelhead. It's also a great trout fly if you're going to be fishing during the hex hatch. It's a great emerger. It's also been really good to me on the lakes. It's had a, a pretty broad use for me. I think more than what it is trying to imitate is the fact that how it imitates it. It swims, you know, it just undulates through the water. It's a pretty simple fly to tie. Uh, I'm going to use a short shanked hook. It's not a not critical. I, you know, used to tie it with egg hooks. Now I'm using a little short shanked wide gap hooks. It doesn't really matter what you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, I'm going to use a pair of black mono eyes. These are smalls. That's the size I usually use for it. Uh, I'm going to have a little piece of rabbit strip that I'm going to have to trim. Uh, I'm going to have a little hackle here. It's a this is a henback. You know, just a cheap three dollar henback. And then I'm going to have a little uh, squirrel belly here for the underbelly. It's a really, it's a pretty fast fly once you get used to tying it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare my uh, rabbit strip. And what I do is I, I take the rabbit strip and rabbit hair fuzz everywhere. And I stand it up so this is going to be the tail. And then I, I take that, I turn it around. <coughs> And I'm going to try to cut this at an angle, just because the gills on the, the nymph are at an angle as well. So you can see, you don't have to get too crazy about trying to trim this out perfectly. Got a little more tail than I want. And you can see, now I've got a, a, quite an a angle. They're longer at the front than they are at the back. That's just to give it that swimmy gill effect on the back of the, the fly. And then where I'm going to tie it in, uh, I put a little, I'll have to cut this, 
my buddy Billy Robinson I went to school with when I was a kid, and he saw me doing this with my glasses, and he told me I looked old. I tried to explain to him that we were the same age, and we weren't 20 anymore. Glasses are your friend. And I'm just cutting a little notch out of the front of this. This is probably really not that critical. It's just to, uh, it's more effect when the flies, when I get it done. <coughs> so I'm using 3 aught monocord thread, dark brown. I'm going to tie in my eyes here. I'm just going to, because they're not weighted, it doesn't matter that they're on the top. Uh, if you were going to use dumbbell eyes, if you wanted to weight it, you could put them on the bottom, keep the hook so the fly didn't spin upside down. If the eyes are on the top and you're using weighted eyes, it flips the hook upside down because they're heavier. All right. <clears throat> now I take this, I forgot to tell you one thing, I use a olive panatone pen. And once I've got that mark, or the, uh, the hide cut, what I did was I went in the back and I, again, this, I don't think this is really critical, but I put little stripes on it, little racing stripes, because the shows the variegation on the fly. And then what I do is I take this and I kind of, I take, it's a permanent pen, I kind of mark the, the sides of the hair. And I'll show you, I'm just, I'm laying this on something, don't do it on your table with the permanent pen. And just mark the sides of the hair really quickly. All right, when you get it done, all I've done is just mark it up a little bit. I've got a little color to the edges, and I usually just go down the side, leave the middle. I kind of blotch it in the middle there. It's just trying to make it look like a hex. They're uh, kind of modeled. They've got, you know, variegation in them. And when I get it all done, it'll just have a little bit. It's not quite as stark white as it would be if I didn't do that. So now I'm going to position this so that I have to tie this in first. And it's just a short little thorax that I'm going to build in there. And now I'm going to take a dubbing, do a dubbing loop. And I'm going to work forward here. <coughs> And take some of this. This is fox squirrel belly dubbing. Uh, it, I don't think that matters. I just like it because it's nice and picky, and it's kind of the the color I like. It, it, it's not critical the type of dubbing you use. I'm sure. At one point, uh, when we first started fishing this fly, it was so successful we were kind of eating them up in a hurry, and I took some just strips with me, just rabbit strips to the river and we were gluing them onto hooks to see if it would work and it, it still worked. So I, I think it's more action than it is all this stuff we build into it, but I would still rather do it this way. <coughs> now I'm going to build a kind of a fat little thorax here, go in and out of the eyes. And I'm going to leave myself room to tie this off and get my hackle in here. I'm going to put one turn on there, release the, the loop so it's not as tight. I'll have less buildup that way. Come in here. Now I'm going to take this hen back. This, again, the, the, a lot of this stuff isn't really that critical. I'd, you don't necessarily have to have the the hen back in there. I stripped the left side of the feather when you're looking at it, just so when I tie it in, it I don't have quite so much buildup. And you can see with this picky uh, body material, a lot of times I really don't tie in the hackle at all. I just I don't think you really need it, but just for effect, we'll tie it in there. Tie it right in front of the eyes. <clears throat> so now I've got, I've got a little hackle, you know, so much of this is for us and it really dresses it up just a little bit. 
and got a little bit of that sticking down in the eye. Okay. Now just get everything out of the, the front of the eye. Got a little bit of that hackle stem there. <coughs> Separate the hackle so it's not obscuring the, the eyes at all. I don't need the top ones at all. I'm just going to get them out of my way. And now you see where I cut this little notch right here? That's just going to be the pinchers out the front of the, the bug. And I'm going to stretch this just a little bit. Tie it in. I'm pretty certain that the steelhead don't stop and look at those pinchers but it does dress it up a little bit. I'm just going to whip finish underneath that. Hey, I think I can get it underneath there. And that's it. And what you'll see in the water with this, once that stuff gets all, when it's swimming, the fly swims in the backside. This will all lay down. Uh, you can trim that even tighter on the top right there. I don't have anything swimming right there. But as it goes through the water, this thing undulates up and down. This little abdomen does. And these things are, you know, off color. And there's, if you look at a hexagenous gills, they're on the abdomen. They're on the, each side laterally on the abdomen. And they, they really undulate. They, if you look at one just swimming, sitting there in the, in the water, he just, they just do this back and forth. And this little rabbit here, once it gets, you know, fluffed up and wet, it just swims through the water. And I've had, for steelhead, trout, lake flies. I fished this fly in the west where they don't have hexagenia, and I'm, I'm certain it's just that swimmy action, and they, they really like it. But that's all there is to it. The video Wet Fly Ways with Davey Watton is what we have drawn from to make this instructional segment. We will be looking at how to present a cast of wet flies and soft hackles upstream. Davey does the instruction and fly fish host Gary Taylor serves as the willing student. A cast of flies is how wet flies were traditionally fished in the British Isles where fly fishing was developed. Watton, a transplanted Welshman, has been determined to show Americans how to present this set of flies properly and to convince them that wet flies were not meant to be fished simply down and across current as is the common practice. ...to hook itself on the flies back behind us right in this seam. That is a you know, deadly system that's, you've got that's right just, there. That's how you go. I mean, you just stand there talking away about fishing, just leave the flies in the water and they're that good and they just can't resist it. Up they come Do you really need to even be here on the river to do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You know, I can tell you a few funny stories about some big fish I've... Uh, I'll get him for you. That just goes really to prove a point, you know, that that fly just animating itself there in that current on that seam was enough to get that fish to want to come and come and eat it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my approach really for this is this, I'm objectively looking at this water, I've got a good current seam in front of me, I've got fast flowing water to my right, I'm going to work my flies upstream and just cover this water. Now you've got two, two options really to do this. The first one is you make a direct upstream approach slightly to the right because the, the current flow is to our right mm -hmm. and just keep pacing up, make three or four casts, no interest, keep going, keep going. The other option is that we fish the upstream method first and then slightly move our angle of presentation across. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to go like quarter angle or quadrant so to speak from there to there. So we're going to work our way upstream in that direction. We're not worried about fishing downstream because to all intensive purposes when we've walked upstream we've we fish that water anyway. What we might choose to do if we've walked up whatever 50, 100 yards or whatever on our return journey, fish a more across and or downstream technique mm. work with right now. Do what's logical. Absolutely right, yeah. First of all, I'm gonna look for the current seam in which we can visually see. And uh, it's really a short line presentation. That's pretty much all it is. You know, just enough fly line there to enable us to get the cast of the flies out on the surface of the water and just basically dead drift them and just let them track back at the mercy of the current and the whim of it. Just raising that level now, foot rod back as you come. That's right. You have to have control. You can't keep the rod at a direction pointed straight at the surface of the water because the line's just backing down on us and should we get a fish hit the fly? Well, the rod's up today before we've even moved them and we're not going to connect. So what it is really is a, a, an action whereby flies are delivered 
rod is immediately start to be raised, but not in a way it's actually causing or dragging those flies back faster than the current yeah, is actually taking up moving. your slack as it That's comes That's basically back to what it is. Yeah. Without stripping all the line back in, making several false casts to get it back out. Right. We're just, we're just basically presenting those flies in an upstream direction. But, I mean, it's not a direct straight upstream from my standpoint. Those flies are actually moving over from my left to my right, so they're yeah, tracking down. By just a few degrees, but enough. To That's correct, absolutely to right. Come past you. We, we've kind of worked this area around and we didn't get anything that was interested to, to take those flies. Well, they might not be there, I might be doing something wrong or whatever, but now we just take a couple of paces upstream. Pretty much I make about a two or three yard uh, walk, that's all. Pretty much the length of the leader, that's the way to look at it. If you've got, say, a 12 Ooh. foot leader on, you've got like four yards, well, make four yards upstream and just keep working up like that. So pretty much you just work in every option that you've got to effectively get those flies to work in the surface and try to that's get those fish up. Thumb. There's enough weight within those three flies to keep them there. To unroll that's right. the whole assembly to the fish. I mean, I've had them myself. Look round there, there's a whole bunch of big rainbows just yeah. and there that right fish, on your heels. You see he just took me uh -oh, really uh -oh. he took me really, really subtle. Was, he took you serious too, didn't he? Yeah. There was no splash, nothing. <laughs> he just lightly sucked it in. He did. And you and you really got to be on the ball to kind of get this technique of fishing down That's to a it. mark. Key for maintaining just some contact with that point fly or that anchor fly. I do. And and what I also do is, you know, I watch like a hawk my top drop of fly. That's that's for you down there. that that's kind of like my trigger point, so to speak. Uh, insofar as that if he takes that I'm gonna see it anyway, but if he takes the fly that's down below it, I'm gonna see that fly do something. It's probably gonna just drop down in the surface of the water and there you go, see? Not a bad rainbow. Uh-huh. Well, thanks for testing the theory out here, guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. He's out of there. A lot of the, the, the way of thinking in this country is that such flies are just fish across and downstream, which, you know, is not the real, I'm not saying don't catch fish, but if you really want to understand the arts of fly fishing like this and catch a whole bunch more fish, you have to learn the upstream techniques. And certainly where soft tackles are concerned, they are more effectively fished upstream than they ever are downstream. Those really? Certainly they are. Those flies are basically not flies that are designed to be moved and pulled against current. They lose all of the elements of life and effect that they've Just got. Just close on. up, I guess. Of course they? they do. And some people argue, well, you know, they may look like a nymph form and this, that and the other. Well, they may well do, but they certainly look more effective fished or tracked down to a fish. When you when you first deliver your line and your flies to the surface, try to get the rod tip low to some extent with everything absolutely straight. Because instantly they've landed, it's gonna to start to track to you anyway. Then just kind of get it up there and just keep your flies moving back towards you. We can cover a lot of water this way. Oh, of very course you can, very, very too. effectively. Okay, now just move up the water Another four paces. A few feet. As you would imagine, you know, if we had a situation here where we had a, a lot of fish actually rising, oh, yeah. then you know the odds are much more in your favour to, to be taking those that fish top to fly take. But away from you, wouldn't it? Absolutely right. See how subtle that fish took you? I mean it didn't hit you down hard, he just kind of come up, he gracefully took that fly. Isn't that a neat way to catch a fish? I'm telling you. Uh, just saw the line come tight, basically never felt it. Yeah. Just sensed he was there. Took the second fly. Yeah, he took he took the uh, fly we call the Invicta, which is which is that fly which was you know kind of tied there to represent the the caddis in the stage of emergence, which is the next one down. Good job. Right. Thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome. Well, show me more, Davy. Well, I will. Well, pretty much what we've did now uh, is to 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 work more of an up. To an upstream and slightly to an across angle like this allowing the flies and that just to track round to our left hand side now you may be in a situation where you do need to make a, an upstream cast further than what we've been doing at this point of time and you may be obstructed in some way or other to be able to physically walk there for one reason or that or right. you don't want to get there because you might spook fish because you've got to get up on a bit of high ground on the bank side and you know various things like that will determine the fact that 
Well, in order to get my flies presented to those fish, I have to make more or a longer upstream cast. Well, of course, the consequences are when you do that, you have to put fly line on the surface of the water. The thing to remember about it is that when you do that, is you try to, regardless of which side of the, the current seam and or position you are fishing, you do it so that your flies are at a good angle out, either to the left or the right of your fly line. So no way does your fly line move back down over those fish. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can initiate certain casts, which of course kick your flies out to the left or the right. You can move yourself physically to the left or the right. Bottom line really at the end of the day is you keep those flies tracked out to the right hand side of that fly line. And I, my choice to do it is this, is pretty much to bring the rod tip over on my left shoulder when I'm casting out to the right. And that is absolutely the easiest way just to keep those flies out at that. Because don't forget we're fishing uh, three flies on pretty fine tippet and we don't want to do something that's going to initiate those flies to get tangled. So by just moving the casting arm over to the left hand side you see the relative angle we're now getting right okay as opposed to kind of casting more upstream like this we can be more direct with an across stream presentation like that we cast at that angle approximately two o'clock first of all we let the flies track down in that position but as the flies come close to us we start to raise the rod and just bring those flies around slightly on the turn like that Sometimes, you know, those fish will literally swim downstream and take fly. I'm sure you have seen that in a past. Oh, yeah, they'll follow it. Oh, yeah. 30, and, 40 feet sometimes. And just that little turn around there is just there is. usually enough to take you quite right. And I miss that, too. I was concentrating really on talking to you. But just that little turn around like that, you know, is enough to just trigger that fish's response just to take that fly. But it allows us to work further away. And with skill, you can, you know, get a long, long way to, you know, 50, 60 feet is not by any stretch of the imagination, out of order. There he is, same fish, same place. Better fish too. Yeah. Just a little subtle take. Very. And you know, a lot of times when we fish this way, even though we've missed the fish, we've not did anything really serious to upset him. You know, we've not stuck the hook in him, pulled it out, he's just missed the fly. And he may well come back and look for it a second time round. Well, I think the fish like your technique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's done real well for me most of my life. It certainly has. Mm -hmm.